Welcome everyone to a live taping of the Africa podcast. Um, with us, we have a special guest. Christopher Silver is the Siegel Family Assistant Professor in Jewish History and Culture at the Department of Jewish Studies at McGill University, recipient of awards from the Posen Foundation, the American Academy of Jewish Research, and the American Institute for Maghrib Studies. Uh, Chris's scholarship and writing on Jews, Muslims, and popular culture across North Africa has appeared in the International Journal of Middle East Studies, as well as many other places. He is the founder and curator of the website gramophone.com, which we're going to explore. And his first book, which is the focus of today's conversation, is Recording History, Jews, Muslims, and Music Across 20th Century North Africa, um, which is coming out or is out on Sanford University Press. Um, Chris, welcome to Africa. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's it's a pleasure to be here. So I guess the first question is, um, you know, I like asking, uh, getting some information about people's perspective. Um, and most people's childhood, a lot of memories of people's childhood, when they reflect back on their childhood is music, right? I can think of the albums that came out. I can think of like what music I was listening to when I was 12 and 15 and 18. Um, what music did you listen to growing up? That's a great question right out of the gate. Uh, <laughs> uh, what did I listen to uh, growing up? So in my earliest year, I, I grew up in a, in a type of, of musical family. Uh, so I was exposed to quite a bit. Uh, so this is everything from sort of like the Greenwich Village folk scene uh, to Motown uh, as well, and sort of like with a heavy emphasis on uh, on, on Motown. So I, I sort of feel like um, Stevie Wonder provided a soundtrack to my early years, and now I'm sure. attempting to force that on my children as well, just to, to some success. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, you know, I was a I was a teen at a certain time, so sort of like '90s hip hop also. Loomed. Yeah quite large in my life. Maybe, maybe the same for you. Definitely, uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, and so it's pretty, you know, it's, um, it's pretty diverse and it's almost, I, I don't know, I would almost say like there's a, there's an anti-algorithm quality to it, which I miss and lament. I mean, so, sort of like n now that you asked this question, I'm thinking back to, um, I grew up in Los Angeles where, mm -hmm. uh, to go to school, it's usually not the case that you walk. You either uh, take the bus or you carpool, right? A bunch yeah. of kids fell into a car. And eventually you're driving yourself with others, you know, 16, 17. Uh, and so all of a sudden you're with people who have different musical tastes than you. So I remember also being exposed to punk as a 16, 17, 18 year old. Um, and that was a revelation for me, uh, as well. So, uh, met many different, uh, influences. That makes sense. And, uh, yeah, I mean the nineties for sure. So like you get into a car and all of a sudden you hear Radiohead and then you hear Dr. Dre and Red Hot uh, exactly, Chili Peppers. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or people feeding it into, uh, the tape deck or the CD player or whatever. For sure. With. The reason why I ask is because I was hoping this would be the answer. And I was hoping that you came across the music that you're exploring now mm. sort of later on. And I'm curious, when did you come across this music? Yeah, it wasn't until uh, I wasn't until much, uh, much later. Uh, the first time. I suppose the first time I probably seriously encountered this music was in 2005. Um, I had just graduated. Uh, I just finished my BA at, at UC Berkeley, um, and uh, I was trying to figure out next steps. And, and one of those next steps was to head to Morocco uh, to work on my uh, to work on my Arabic and also become uh, better acquainted with the place. Uh, and there and then is when I first encountered uh, Moroccan music and all of its diversity. Uh, and I was really I was really taken by it. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, eventually, over the years, as I sort of figured out that I was being uh, led toward this uh, particular moment, uh, I would eventually find myself in in 2009, so a long time ago, but but not that long ago, uh, in Casablanca. Uh, Morocco kept on sort of uh, calling me, pulling me in, and I was walking down the street, 
And there before me uh, was uh, an actual uh, record store that sold uh, records, not CDs, but but records. Uh, sure. sort of, you know, one of the last of, it, of its era. Um, and I asked the proprietor for uh, a sonic tour nicely and with the promise to, to purchase some things. Uh, and, and he obliged and, and sort of just, you know, just this, this cascade of incredible, uh, different, um, diverse, uh, uh, musical repertoires, uh, started to emanate from the, the speakers of, of this, uh, this aging store. Uh, and, and in some ways the rest is history. Um, he, he said some things to me, uh, in that store that, that intrigued me. He sort of, yeah. um, he, you know, I, I sort of consider it like a whisper. So much, so much of, uh, historical inquiry starts with someone out of context and out of place saying something to you. And, and he said a few things to me that sparked my interest and, um, and well, We'll get yeah. into it. We'll get into it. So I want to read a little bit of the the sort of the blurb about this book. Um, it says, in this book, you trace the path of hit makers and hit records, illuminating, illuminating regional and transnational connections. In asking what North Africa once sound, uh, sounded like, you recover a world of many voices of pioneering impression uh, and pioneering impresarios, daring female stars, cantors turned composers, witnesses and survivors of war and national and nationalistic icons um, where music still resonates well into our present. So I'm curious if you were to explain to a 15 year old or to like a teenager, right? You were, you were to explain, in fact, to your 15 year old self <laughs> and you're like, Hey, in about 20 years, I'm going to write a book about, Jews, Muslims, and music across 20th century North Africa. Mm -hmm. That guy probably says, what does Jewish music and Muslim music sound like from North mm -hmm. Africa? How would you describe it? Before we listen to it, we're going to listen to it in a second, but like, what, what well, would how you describe? would I describe the music itself? Yeah, the music. Ah, okay. That's also a great question. And sort of like, uh, I think at one point I'm going to have to start, uh, not on this uh, podcast, but at some point in the future, I need to start um, singing because uh, that's sort of like the best way to... Um, uh, we can start right now. Go for it. <laughs> but <laughs> Challenge so, so accepted. There's, there's, so first of all, I would say um, it depends how, how much patience this 15-year-old has. But I would say, again, sort of uh, diversity is, is the key word here. So, you know, like any scene, we're talking about um, uh, lots of different sounds and, and many different influences. The music, I don't speak about in the book at great length is probably the music that would bore uh, the 15 year old. Uh, and this is the Andalusian repertoire. Um, so this is the, the, the music that has sort of enjoyed the lion's share of um, attention from scholars for sort of, uh, there's a logic to it. There's a logic to why um, it's so evocative, um, but it's also a, a high art uh, tradition. It's very staid, uh, slow. It's a, it's a sweet music. Um, the popular music um, uh, uh, I describe in the book and I write about and, and that I'm so interested uh, from the beginning of the 20th century through uh, mid 20th century um, sounds eclectic, I would say. Um, so you have um, instruments that uh, people would be familiar with uh, from the region, North Africa and the Middle East. So yeah. there, if you can imagine for a second, sort of a layer of uh, oud or uh, kamanja, a violin sort of played upright uh, on the knee, sort of um, uh, uh, bowed uh, instruments that, that start to set uh, a pace and a, and a, and a tempo. Uh, and then you would add a layer of uh, percussion uh, as well. Uh, so sometimes uh, darbuka, the, the goblet drum, which produces um, a sort of a, a popping sound. Uh, we have uh, tar as well, a large frame drum. Uh, there's a number of uh, droning sounds that are produced as well. Uh, and so you can start to imagine sort of the, the buildup uh, for this music. And then all of a sudden, especially when we get into the 20s and 30s, um, these musicians who are just incredible at um, innovating, uh, bring in the sounds of cha-cha-cha, uh, rumba, yeah. uh, jazz, uh, and are also 
uh, quite playful with their lyrics. Um, uh, and so they're singing about uh, topics like uh, love, uh, sex, uh, marriage, uh, women's liberation, uh, with often a, a female voice at front. Um, mm. So they're singing songs like, I don't want to get married, or I want to go to the cinema, uh, or... Um, uh, essentially, I, I'm, I'm looking for someone with deep pockets, so prove yourself to me. Uh, and so they're really like pushing the boundaries, uh, incredible voices uh, with this really diverse set of uh, instruments providing the background. So if I was a listener in the 1950s and I heard this song come on, yeah. would I own this like hypothetical song? Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One, were listeners hyper local so were these listeners that were exclusively in north africa um and north africa is huge obviously but i mean like like a tunisian singer is mostly heard by tunisian uh ears that's the first question and the second question if that's not true if a listener hears it in egypt or in palestine are they like oh yeah this is totally a obviously this genre and this perspective and this mm. type of music coming from there? Yeah, that's a great question. So as you said, you know, North Africa, depending on sort of like where where we, we call its end point, right? Like somewhere, yeah. let's say like in the middle of Libya or, or something like that on, on its eastern side, um, is, is, is a wide uh, region. Um, and, you know, in the book, I, I really am trying to tell a North African story. In other words, you know, like every chapter doesn't deal with just a, a particular place. There's there's movement involved at, at every turn. Uh, and so these musicians and their music uh, are moving across North Africa. That's for sure. Um, uh, Louisa Tunsia, who I'm sure we'll hear uh, soon enough, uh, uh, a Tunisian Jewish artist uh, born in, in, in 1905, uh, who becomes quite popular in the 1920s and, and 1930s. I mean, she's touring uh, from uh, 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 Casablanca to uh, Tripoli and Benghazi in, in, in Libya. That's sort of her frame, as well as, as the metropolitan France. Mm. Uh, but she never goes east of there. So much of this music... Uh, not all of it, but much of this music is in a way contained to North Africa and everywhere where North Africans are. Some of these artists, in fact, have origins in uh, the Middle East, uh, in Palestine uh, as well. And so in some cases, they're already known entities uh, there uh, wow. or making their way uh, to North Africa. There are other cases where because of the type of songs that are being sung uh, and the popularity that accrue with them, uh, they sort of jump the shark. Um, and so one of uh, these uh, figures is uh, another Tunisian Jewish uh, female artist by the name of Habiba Masika, uh, born just before uh, Louisa Tunisia in, in 1903 in, in Tunis into a musical family. And because she sort of, um, she sings quite a bit about um, Egypt and Iraq, and she, she, she's covering songs that are made famous uh, uh, by others, uh, but she's singing them in a Tunisian context uh, with, with uh, national, nationalist, anti-colonialist uh, motivation. Yeah. Because her version is uh, so appreciated, um, her Tunisian iteration of the songs of Egypt uh, end up in Egypt, uh, end up in the Sham, end up uh, wherever um, also um, uh, migrants from uh, the Levant uh, uh, end up. So I have a... I have a in my collection, I have a copy of a Habib Musika record uh, that uh, um, originated. It's it's a long story, but it's it's recorded originally in it's recorded originally in Berlin uh, for a label called Bidafon, uh, which is a sort of a Beirut-born uh, label that was quite uh, important uh, across the the region at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, but that 
really is headquartered uh, in in Berlin, and and they invite uh, artists uh, to record there. So she records this in in Berlin. At one point, this uh, this recording about uh, now I'm thinking about one about um, uh, Syria and, and Syrian uh, independence uh, in the 1920s. Um, it it fans out uh, across North Africa, uh, across uh, the the Middle East as well. And at one point, uh, a migrant from uh, uh, Syria brings it with him to Detroit uh, and places an address label on it that says, you know, so-and-so's record uh, uh, from Detroit. And it's sort of like a if found, if lost and if found yeah. return to this person. So, um, you know, this oh, cool. music, which is quite diffuse and diverse, is circulating remarkably around the globe. Um, and what's also remarkable about that is the, the fragility of these records. Uh, they're made of a, a, a brittle uh, material that's difficult to, to transport. Uh, we think about sort of like how these people are moving at the time in the 20s and 30s by steamer. Uh, and, you know, the fact that they're holding on to this music, that it survives, uh, is um, I, I take a lot of uh, solace in that. It's sort of just to hold it uh, in your hands uh, accrues with it a, a great amount of meaning. Yeah. Okay, I want to listen to some of the some of the music. So I have I have a couple of excerpts, and so maybe you you mentioned Luisa already. Let's take a listen to this, and then maybe we can um, talk about if you think this is representative of what this entire genre sounds like. If it's a, if it's a single genre. Okay, so Chris, I have a question for you. I'm going to put this lower. Um, as Luis is singing in the background, I have a question for you. If I played that for you and you didn't know the record, like this, some like crate find, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. would you be like, oh my God, this is a Jewish singer from Tunis from the 20s? Definitely. So that's a good, so that's a good question. So, you know, um, the, uh, the the question of sort of like is this is this Jewish music it sort of like looms uh, large here. Yeah. Um, so th there's like a few ways to answer it. I mean, one sort of like at this moment in time in Tunisia, most not all, but most of the female stars are indeed Jewish. Not all, but but most. And so you could sort of. Uh, you could guess that she is by sort of just that that sort of um, that that sort of uh, line of, of thinking. Um, there are other musicians who sort of belie their origins because they might sing with a certain Jewish accent, right? So in the same way that there's sort of um, uh, regional accents or accents associated with with cities, um, so too, in certain cases, did Jews sing with a certain accent uh, when, when they sang? This would Arab. be the equivalent of if I like start rapping and I sound like I'm from Brooklyn, it's because I grew up listening to Biggie. Something like that, or if you were from Brooklyn itself, you would you might have a hard time shaking off that accent you might not be interested uh, in it at all there were other musicians who um wanted to sort of uh 
understood the sort of potential uh, or, or the ways in which they could uh, transcend their either, you know, like their particular uh, city uh, or their background uh, by singing at a certain register. And again, we, you know, we can think about this in, in all sorts of ways. Like we're constantly shifting the way in which we speak, depending on our audience uh, or, I mean, obviously, especially the case with Arabic, but it works for, for many languages as well, uh, whether someone's on a, uh, Afikra uh, or Al Jazeera, it is it, sort of the way in which you're going to speak Arabic is, is going to is going to change. Uh, and even when you attempt to speak another type, uh, you might be- belie your your origin. So you know, on the face of it, um, there's um, in terms of sort of the what we're hearing here. There's nothing that that marks this as Jewish per se, except for the fact that Luisa Tuncia is Jewish. Uh, also, if you look in sort of in parentheses under uh, Mafish Filous, uh, you see there's a figure by the name of uh, Maurice Benais, uh, who was a, a Tunisian Jewish composer as well. Uh, and so you start to sort of look at a at a at an, this industry in a particular way. Um, but what we hear here and this is what i what i argue in the book as well is that i'm not making the point that this is jewish music in fact this is what we can say sort of the music of the time we can say tunisian music north african music a music that obviously sometimes draws as well on um uh, levantine arabic uh, as well um uh, uh but it's also the music in many ways of the people so there's there's in some ways uh, there's a way to dismiss this song as a ditty, right? A sort of mafish fedus, mafish kalam, you know, like yeah. there's no money, there are no words. Um, but there's something quite uh, daring and novel here about what she's doing at this moment in time as we're in the midst of sort of a, an early iteration of, of women's rights, feminism across the region, the fact that she's uh, up front, in front of the mac- microphone, and we also hear her backed by uh, um, uh, a male ensemble as well, sort yeah. of the placement of men and women here. And so, um, you know, we would not consider this sort of the feminism of, of today, uh, yeah. but in its own way, it's sort of, it's, it's giving voice to uh, uh, um, changing social norms at the time. Yeah, I want to ask you, so I'm, for those listening to the podcast on the screen, there is the record, lay, the actual record, oh, the sort of the jacket. Right. So right, I'm curious, right. um, I'm, I'm curious about a bunch of things. Like you mentioned the, the parenthetical name, Maurice, I can't see the name, but nice, nice, um, yeah. is this, walk me through the nuts and bolts of how this song was written, recorded and distributed. Um, yeah. Because your book is called Recording History. So clearly it's about the idea of the industry as well. Yeah. So like 40 years before, were there, you know, these songs being written and then just performed in coffee shops and then they become sort of anthemic in that way. And then all of a sudden this new technology emerges and an industry emerges from it. Yeah, I mean, you got it, but I'll I'll I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tease it out a little bit. I mean, so... You know, first of all, we have recording technology from from the end of the 19th century uh, already. So, you know, famously, uh, Edison uh, will record uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb on a piece of tinfoil in the 1870s, uh, and thus sort of recording technology is born. We, we actually have earlier uh, iterations or attempts uh, at, uh, at recording, um, but let's say the end of the 19th century, and already quite quickly, uh, we move to um, the wax cylinder, or the Edison cylinder. So it's a, a cylinder uh, in which someone, and this process would continue, but the idea is um, uh, people approach a horn, um, they sing and play into the horn. Uh, that triggers um, a stylus, which etches that uh, song, in the case of a cylinder, uh, into into the into the uh, wax of the cylinder. Uh, eventually, by the turn of the 20th century, we'll, we'll move on to um, um, uh, Berliner's uh, innovation, which is the disc, the, the record, sort of as we, in some ways, as we as we know it, um, and and. From there, these uh, records will be um, often um, sent 
uh, elsewhere to be pressed, uh, duplicated, and then uh, returned to North Africa in this case. So they move around uh, quite a bit. Um, in an earlier uh, moment, um, there were traditions that that circulated sort of quite uh, widely. So before recording, I mean, there, there were songs or iterations of songs that, that also circulated uh, quite uh, widely. Uh, with recording, um, of course, the process is accelerated. Um, you also have a, a repertoire that's necessarily truncated. Um, so um, uh, shellac records, uh, so it's the, the material that I've sort of been uh, hinting at, um, uh, which tended to be, um, let's say, 10 to 12 uh, inches in, in diameter, 25 to 30 centimeters um, uh, in diameter, uh, spinning at about 78 rotations per minute. So the, the LP spins at oh. 33 rotations yeah. per minute. Uh, so this was much faster uh, and held less music. It held about three minutes of music per side, sort of like this is where we get that perfect three minute pop song uh, from yeah. uh, from this period. Um, and 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 then, of course, once the sort of mechanics of it happen. So Ben Nais, uh, let's say, writes uh, Mafish Fruz. Uh, he's in close contact with Luis Atuncia and the, and the musicians. Uh, uh, but he's uh, writing it. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. he's writing writing it with a commercial agenda to begin with. He is a professional songwriter. He understands that he will write this, record it, and sell some records. Yeah, so some of these people are professionals. Uh, Luisa Tunzia is, is one of them. Some of the composers are professionals as well. Uh, many of them are not because um, in, in some ways it sort of tracks to today. It's quite difficult to make um, enough money to support yourself or a yeah. family uh, through through music. So um, there's there's definitely sort of a, a class dimension to this where uh, many of those who are sort of at the forefront of, uh, of composing, uh, uh, singing, um, uh, uh, playing instruments are by day you know, uh, cobblers or uh, work in the yeah. textile uh, industry. I mean, it, it's there. there's a class dimension to this, which also, which also means that many of these people grow up with one another in the same small, compact uh, quarter uh, and, and, and know each other. Um, and so it, it's a very intimate uh, industry uh, in that way. Uh, and then uh, quickly, of course, there emerges a, a whole distribution um, uh, apparatus. Mm. Um, and so the question is, you know, like, how do these records move across uh, North Africa? So we have, you know, major uh, labels that emerge. Uh, we see an image of, of Bidaphone uh, as, uh, as one of them, that Beirut-born but Berlin-based one that I described earlier, um, uh, as well as sort of uh, a large group of, of middlemen who um, might not own a, a record store in, in Casablanca in the 20s and 30s, but will uh, buy, you know, 20, 30 copies of a single record and take it to uh, the pre-Saharan region of Morocco or will smuggle it across the border into Algeria. And so they loom large in the story as well. Amazing. All right, let's listen to another one. This is Habiba Masika, who you mentioned a few times. Um, let's pull this up. I have so many questions about this. All right. Um, 
So this early on, I sort of mentioned how the book explores uh, nationalism and um, the role that plays or the role the music plays in sort of um, those causes. What is the story about this song? I mean, the musically, there's a lot of like interesting things going on. Um, so what is this song trying to accomplish, you think? Yeah, so this, I mean, so this is a song that's in, 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 uh, in reality, it's quite widely uh, sung at this time. Um, and so, uh, and, and recorded as well. Um, uh, Palestinian artists are uh, recording it, uh, Habiba Masika and, and others uh, as well. I mean, what's going on? For those on? who don't speak Arabic, what does the song mean? Uh, it's a song about um, sort of evoking Syria as her country, as sort of a, a, a beloved uh, place in her imagination. Uh, she speaks about um, she speaks about uh, what she refers to as as pride in Syria, Arab pride uh, in, in Syria, uh, and the context here is. Um, she records this in 1928. Um, there's an uh, historical event uh, between 1925 and 1927 uh, called the Great Syrian Revolt. And so this is, you know, in, in essence, a sort of um, an uprising against uh, French rule uh, in the in the Levant uh, that in, in many ways registers uh, quite a few successes. It will eventually uh, be uh, put down, but it also serves as inspiration for um, at least a, a feeling of sort of uh, nationalism come anti-colonialism across the wider region, sort of what's yeah. happening uh, with the Great Syrian Revolt. And she records this in 1928. So in some ways, just a few months after the end of this revolt, and she records it beyond the bounds of French control in North Africa. So she goes to Berlin uh, to record with the Beidafon label. Uh, and there we see this shift uh, in her music where um, uh, some of the sort of, um, some of her most nationalist and anthemic songs that really draw on uh, sort of Middle Eastern themes. So uh, uh, singing about Syria, but also about um, Egypt as sort of a, a, a beacon of, um, let's say, um, Arab pride, liberation, independence as well, uh, similar, similar things uh, with Iraq. Uh, and so, you know, what ends up happening is sort of every time uh, Masika sings about the East, let's say, it becomes a, a metonym for uh, what's happening in North Africa. And this is not me sort of placing that on this song or on her. Um, this is what our historical actors at the time are, are telling us. So yeah. um, she, this song becomes both extremely um, popular uh, in uh, Tunisia and Algeria, but especially in Morocco as well. So here we have uh, a Tunisian Jewish woman uh, recording a song uh, about Syria in Berlin and its popularity soars in Morocco, which of course is also under um, uh, French control uh, yeah. at the and Spanish uh, control. It, this, it reminds me of, do you remember those, we're about the same age, do you remember that campaign in, um, in the U.S., in the sort of 2000, early 2000s, we are all Palestinians. Do you remember that campaign? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very yeah. similar. It has a very similar vibe to that. Like yeah. we are all in this fight, um, you know, uh, we stand with Ukraine type thing. I think so. I mean, I yeah. think, you know, the, the sort of like it, it's, um, it, there's something natural to it. Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, the, the region is connected in, in, uh, in many ways. And so, um, the sort of using Syria or employing Syria at, at this point in time as, as this sort of, uh, symbol of, of what could be exactly, uh, um, you know, we, we see like various iterations of this, um, where you identify your own revolution with the revolution elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I agree with you. Speaking musically, I mean, earlier on, you sort of, um, you alluded to this idea of, you know, a lot of the, most of the female singers in Tunisia at the time were Jewish, but like sonically, musically, are there musical sort of motifs or tools 
or things going on <clears throat> that one, a listener could identify as being, oh, this is actually like traced back to mm. this other genre that most of these, you know, these mm. young singers would have been exposed to. Like uh, giving you an example, like if you listen to like salsa music, n- like New York and salsa music, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're like, oh yeah, they are, they're, they are referencing the song that their parents probably exposed mm. them to from Cuba and Puerto yeah. Rico before they even got to New York. And that's, that's, dripping in the music even though they're also referencing funk and jazz and all this other yeah. stuff that's more of yeah. new york are there yeah. things going on like that yeah i mean so i mean in some ways you know when when you hear sort of like this anthemic music or, or some of it's sort of militaristic as well i mean uh they're they're drawing on those things on on sort of the the, the militarism that's in music at the at the turn of the of the 20th century yeah. and we can do this in like uh those, side, those off, ascending side, those ascending like, fourths <laughs> yeah and, and you know like if you think of um if you know uh said darwish's uh umia masri uh, which just sort of like fits into this uh, uh, ge- this genre as well. It's it's sort of it's very uh, pounding uh, stand up uh, and get, and get up uh, and uh, and sort of uh, stand at a uh, stand at attention. Um, l- much of the popular music does have an Andalusian base, mm-hmm. um, and so um, there's there's that element. So this is the uh, multimodal uh, sweet music for those who, who aren't familiar. The multimodal uh, sweet music, which sort of, which, which claims origins in medieval Islamic Iberia, uh, Al Andalus, um, uh, and which has sort of heavier movements and and lighter movements. And so there's often that base. Like I said, they're also drawing on um, a world of influences that is the 1920s and, and 1930s. And, and in this way, it's not unique to North Africa, right? Like rumba at this point in time becomes, um, huge in, in West Africa as well. Uh, Cuban music becomes, uh, also, uh, really popular in, in sub-Saharan Africa at, at this moment in time. And it, it's, it owes to the record trade. Um, so the exposure to that music owes to, uh, the, the record industry, uh, at that time. Habiba Masika is drawing influences all over the place, again, because of the diversity of uh, North African music. So um, um, uh, in some of her music, she's drawing on um, the the trance healing traditions of North Africa, um, whose origins point south rather than, than north to uh, Al-Andalus. So uh, Stambeli or uh, Rebaibia, um, sort of in some ways analog to uh, Gnawa um, and, and, and other such um, uh, Zar, you know, when we move farther uh, east. Uh, and so they're diverse in sort of the, the, the minds of these musicians. Are, are really worlds unto themselves, right? I mean, it's we can point at, at influence and, and things like that, but like how how and you know not, maybe perhaps I'm thinking of the composers, but how how they're crafting these hits so quickly, one after another, and drawing on uh, uh, flamenco and Andalusian music, and 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 hearing those commonalities as well. I mean, they're sort of obvious to us now, but they're really pushing the envelope now. And so, um, it's it's not an easy task to figure out sort of like where all of this emanates from. Yeah. You can, there's a way to do it superficially, um, but sort of some of some of it, I have to say, is like that that space between like genius and, and magic, you know? It's totally true. It's it's really like um comforting um to know that I mean I I kind of know that it's comforting to be reminded how much a global exchange was going mm-hmm. on then. You know, like it's easy if you listen to like you turn on the radio in the air world and you hear some like reggaeton style yeah, song yeah, yeah. or some some song sounds like it's like you know like sounds like it was like the the beat sounds like it was re- produced in in Atlanta and it would be easy to roll your eyes and be like come on this is ridiculous yeah but it's never not been that way no i think you're right and and you know exactly what you're pointing to is is some of the way, is some of the reason um, why the popular music has been uh, sort of like swept under the rug or, or pushed under the table. And because at the time, 
a sort of an elite of cultural critics. So both sort of like, let's say, um, Jewish and Muslim voices, as well as um, colonial authorities, uh, really hated this music. Um, and sort of like for exactly <laughs> the reason you're describing, like one, it was popular, right? And like, what do the popular classes know? Uh, two, you know, one of the most popular songs uh, at the time uh, did that uh, unforgivable uh, thing of, of mixing languages. So exactly the process you're describing. So, okay, and that drove the cultural critics crazy that uh, there was a layer of French and then a layer of Arabic and that it rhymed as well in sort of a simple uh, A-A-B-B uh, structure. Uh, was, um, uh, you know, a, a, a crime against uh, uh, sort of, you know, all, um, the humanity. all civilizational uh, goals. <laughs> yeah. And so it, what this has meant is that we have been sort of, in some ways, we've been forced into a forgetting or there's been a silencing of what the most compelling music of the time was. Yeah. Uh, and so... You know, I think recognizing that exactly what you're what you're uh, describing, sort of uh, that it sounds like it could have been, you know, a song popular on Arab radio today that could have been written, or at least the beat could have been written, uh, written probably like composed on a computer in uh, in Atlanta or, or something like that. It's okay. Like we yeah. can, you we know, we should, we all need to be able to live with it. Uh, and there will be those for whom this music does not speak. But for many others, it, it does. There's something about like those uh, pulses and, and impulses. I mean, it it moves people and yeah. moves people sometimes in really surprising ways. Okay, Chris, I'm I, I'm showing a bunch of screenshots from your incredible uh, uh, website, Gramophone, Gramophone, which I mispronounced earlier as Gramophone. Um, no, it's okay. That's, uh... And which, if you want to find it online, it's G H A R A. M O P H O N E. Um, and so you have all these records and a bunch of information about each one. And as you know, we're perusing through them, it kind of stops in the 50s, right? So th the obvious question is what is the impact of, you know, 1928, 36, uh, 48, 56, and mm -hmm. The, um, the Israel Israel Arab wars that happen mm -hmm. and the establishment of Israel on these artists and on the reception of them and on the legacy of this music. Yeah, wow, that's an easy question. Um, yeah, in, in three minutes. <laughs> in what? In three. <laughs> uh, so a, a few things. The reason this stops sort of about 1960 is because um, this technology, the shellac record is replaced by the vinyl record. It's eclipsed by the vinyl record, which speaking of 1948, 1948 is also the appearance of the unbreakable vinyl record. So this is the moment in time in which uh, the industry begins to shift. Um, the album is created, right? So yeah. previously these are sort of one-off songs for the, for the most part. And so the concept of the, the album uh, comes into being. And so in the book, what I do is sort of, I, I, wanted, I wanted to trace... Uh, a North African history, a Jewish history, a Jewish Muslim history, uh, along the arc of a, of a technology which disrupts our sort of typical periodization scheme, where we might take a look at 1948, uh, the the Nakba, uh, the creation of the state of, of Israel, Palestinian dispossession, and say, okay, well, of course, um, there are, are shockwaves across uh, the region. This reverberates out. And from that moment forward, uh, let's say the Jewish-Muslim relationship is um, irreparably um, uh, um, uh, broken, uh, and it's difficult to narrate a, a post-1948 history um, g given that 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 seismic shift in, in 1948, um, working with this technology allows me and allows us to to push back that periodization uh, scheme, um, and also sort of following the music and these musicians, it becomes quite clear that 1948, in at least in the North African context, is not the end point. And so, you know, with that, I point uh, to um, figures in Morocco, but also in Algeria and Tunisia, who get their start exactly in 1948, uh, in some cases who are sort of providing 
uh, one of the voices for a sa- for the soundtrack uh, on the march to independence. So Moroccan and Tunisian mm-hmm. independence is in 1956, or Algerian independence in, in 1962. Uh, and then the question here is sort of like of of legacy, or like what what happens to these people and uh, and and their music and and the memory of it. Uh, and here it's. Uh, there's a, I'll try and keep it short, but you yeah. know, a number of things happen. Some musicians remain uh, well past independence, including in, in Algeria, which is a story we don't always uh, talk about or don't always uh, think about. And in that way, we sort of, they sort of become uh, a bellwether for sort of um, what what becomes possible in these places post independence. And, and you see that these musicians remain in place because they say, oh, "My audience is here." Um, Jews and Muslims, my, my audience is here. Uh, and so some of them remain in North Africa until quite late uh, post-independence, until there is a certain recognition that like, oh, my audience is also in metropolitan France, both Jews and Muslims, uh, because of these waves of migration. Um, some of these musicians also head uh, to Israel in the uh, 50s, uh, 60s, and, and afterward, where they continue to sing in, in Arabic uh, as well. Uh, and some of them fan out uh, around the world. So some of them arrive uh, I'm in Montreal. Some of them arrive here in, in Montreal. Um, some of them arrive in New York as well. So in uh, in North America, uh, and they they do like this figure here, same in Maghreb. They 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 have to find sort of a new path for themselves in in a very different place. So uh, Montreal has a large uh, Moroccan Jewish population uh, already in the, in the 1960s, but it's not the same as a Paris or a Marseille or or, or anywhere else. In, in France. Yeah. And so some of them take uh, different directions uh, in their careers while remaining uh, sort of very much embedded in uh, in a musical uh, milieu. The last point about um, memory is um, some of the memories fade because the technology changes and mm. not everything is transferred from that old medium to the new medium. Okay, so just like all of our music got lost <laughs> when we shuffled from iPod Shuffle to whatever it was, uh, yeah. Spotify or, or whatever. Um, so too was it true of, of this moment of sort of that shift to the 1960s, which also corresponds to um, the the beginning and accelerated out-migration of Jews uh, from North Africa uh, as well. And yet you could hear this music in, in many ways. So, um, uh, you know, people don't have an off switch in the way that sort of historians periodize. And so people continue to sing the songs or uh, Jewish artists who now found themselves like Samuel Mugherby, who now found themselves uh, in metropolitan France were recording music that was aimed at Morocco and then would, uh, even after his departure, would... would um, uh, would come back to tour there uh, as well. And so that sort of that dialectic continued um, and the music would still uh, be uh, heard. And so sometimes we we say to ourselves like, oh, we're, we're in a moment of revival where this mu- music is being rediscovered by, by young artists uh, uh, around uh, around the world. You know, I would I would push back on that and say, like, in fact, it, it never quite disappeared, you know, in um in certain moments in like the 1970s, you can hear the same uh, melody um, uh, uh, that was originally um, uh, sung by by a Jewish artist, um, recorded on on vinyl in uh, in Algiers, um, used as a, a synagogue tune in uh, in Casablanca, uh, also performed live in places like uh, Paris and Montreal, and so. You know, there's a conversation that's happening, but historians haven't always been able to put their uh, fingers on it. Chris, I have so many more questions. <laughs> Good questions for you, but we don't have that much. We can do the we, we can do the B side, the outtakes at some point. Yeah, we need to do a we need to do a follow up to this because I have so many more questions. Um, I want to ask you one of the the quick Q and A because we don't have time for all of them, but I do yeah. want to ask you one of them. Um, ask you. Uh, two versions of one of them. One of them is who would you love to shadow for a day? And then the second question I want to ask you is if you were to recommend a few album or a few songs to listen to that we haven't brought up today that we can find on your SoundCloud or on 
mm-hmm. on the website, what are some of those tunes? Okay. Good Lord, who would you love to shadow for a day? That is so good. Um, uh, it has to be a musician. Um, I would like love to be let into that process. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of, um, I'm going to say there is a historical figure in the book that is particularly intriguing to me. This is this figure uh, who sort of is the, um, the visionary behind the recording industry, that early iteration of the recording industry in North Africa, uh, an Algerian Jew by the name of Edmund Nathan Yafil, uh, who worked very closely with a, a figure that you uh, flashed on the screen earlier, uh, Mahidin Bashtarsi. Um, uh, and, and they really provided this, like, exactly this incredible uh, Jewish Muslim uh, one-two punch in um, early 20th century Algeria that, that really set the recording industry and music uh, industry uh, on on its path. Um, but the the sort of, I'm going to use the word vision, but the vision of Yafir, um, who heard Bashtarzi, um, heard him as a teen, heard his voice emanating from a mosque close to Yafir's uh, office in the Kasbah of Algiers, and approached Bashtarzi and said, we're going to give you a slightly bigger venue. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to become the 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 Caruso of of, of the desert, as he was known uh, at the time. Um, you are going to become the 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 the, the father of uh, uh, modern Algerian theater as well. I mean, just that sort of like that that ear for talent uh, in which you're sort of you're you're listening at, at every moment, and, and I imagine sort of you feel sort of moving about the the Casbah, um, you know, uh, tinkering with the technology of the day, um, um, is sort of tapping uh, musicians playing in cafes on the shoulder and bringing them into these um makeshift recording studios i, I wouldn't mind uh he, he was the moroccan barry gordy he was yeah he was the exactly the algeria yeah exactly he was algerian the barry, <laughs> the barry gordy uh or, or exactly uh of his uh of his day so that's someone too and, and i mentioned earlier um also stevie wonder sort of that like the classic period of stevie wonder i'd love to um watch that um happen um what was the other question you asked if there me? any if there are like two or three songs that you think that we haven't um, brought up that you're like oh these are so good these are so fun to listen to anything by salim halali anything by salim halali uh um one of the great North African male voices uh, of uh, of the 20th century. Um, uh, you can find some of his uh, music on my uh, SoundCloud, but like really anything uh, of 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 his, where um, he's just his his lilt, uh, the mawal that really sort of goes into this flamenco uh, thing, uh, the pace uh, of uh, of his music. Um, um, I think people will enjoy if they don't know him already. How do you spell his name? Uh, Salim, S-A-L-I-M. And then he spells the last name H-A-L-A-L-I. Let's listen to this on the way out. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. is going to go up on the podcast tomorrow and up on YouTube. So I'm sure you know people who would love to watch this and catch up. Um, And I believe you can find the book 
everywhere books are sold. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go and search uh, Christopher Silver, Recording History, and you will find it. It's on Sanford University Press, so it's pretty easy to find. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.